please go ahead. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Christina Hardy. I am doing uh, the second part of chart patterns. Uh, this time we're going to be using five volunteers and five volunteer charts to describe, uh, as it says here on this slide, uh, the, we're going to start with the mystic rectangle. And going by my memory, I believe we're going to, go, we're going to be doing the yod, then the kite, and then we also have a volunteer who uh, will be combining the yod with the kite, and then finally with the grand cross. So thank you volunteers for volunteering. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm going to have, just go ahead and dive right in, beginning with the mystic rectangle. And just as a reminder, what the mystic rectangle is. It's uh, the configuration of four planets and uh, it's easiest to find, you have to have two oppositions uh, to, to find uh, the mystic rectangle. So uh, not only do we have the two oppositions, but we have two trines and we have two sextiles and it is considered uh, the mystic, mystic inspiration, uh, sort of the driving force which behind the mystic rectangle. So uh, in uh, part one, um, chart patterns part one, I used uh, Roberto, um, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing his last name, but uh, S. Uh, Gioli, uh, who's a psychi psychiatrist who went beyond the traditional um, psychiatry of his colleagues, which he came soon after Freud uh, in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, and he developed psychosynthesis uh, for the field of psychiatry, which was really innovative, cutting edge. And what was interesting about uh, the mystic rectangle or how it correlated into his life was that he's, he was very um, involved with esoteric teachings. In particular, uh, he utilized the esoteric teachings. I mean, he used many uh, from, from, from the East and so on, but in particular, Alice Bailey's work. So it was a, it's an integrative um, psychiatric psychology and very cutting edge, very innovative uh, during that time. So we're gonna look at our volunteers chart today. Uh, her name is Violet. And um, so here's her chart. And as you can, for most astrologers, we'll be able to see right away, she's got a grand try. However, let's look at, uh, I think, interesting. Yeah. It's not popping up. Let me try something. Does this do it? Yeah, there we go. Sorry. Okay. So uh, let me go back here. So it's sometimes it's hard, especially when you have a lot of uh, engagement in the chart to actually uh, find a mystic rectangle. But the thing that you want to do is to find the oppositions. And here we have, uh, just without putting the overlay on quite yet, but we have the Saturn in opposition to Uranus and Pluto. And then we have the nodal axis um, opposition with Venus here. So uh, now let me put this on top. So we got these two oppositions and the oppositions are connected through two trines and two sextiles. And um, according to Robert Hand in a mystic triangle, um, actually, this is actually generally true for any um, chart patterns, but it's important to have uh, dynamic tension in any chart pattern. And we definitely have this, you know, for, for the energy to have a release point, for the energy to move so one isn't stuck in loops over and over and over again, excuse me. And we definitely have that with the mystic rectangle with the two oppositions. So uh, the trines and the sextiles on their own could just create a loop where there is not, uh, or one is just repeating the old same, same old patterns and having a really hard time breaking out of them. So I'm going to start with the Saturn Uranus opposition here. And, um, and then by the way, uh, for those who are not on this call and who are listening uh, later, we're going to, I'm going to be connecting with the volunteer after I give the description here. So Saturn and Uranus, so um, in the opposition, so we have a dynamic tension here. And as I, I actually just gave a presentation last week, it was just 10 minutes on the Uranus-Saturn uh, relationship and the synastry between Uranus and Saturn. Saturn is about conditioning, okay? Saturn is conditioned consciousness. In Pisces, 
it's actually the ultimate sacrifice that the personality must make as a singular conscious unit, okay, in order to eventually access divine consciousness. But oftentimes, as with Saturn, and one is going through the Saturn return, the many cycles, and even the quadratures of every, well, 29 and a half years, and then the seven-year quadratures usually are challenging points to help shed the conditioning layers that prevent the soul or prevent the individual um, from access, accessing divine consciousness. Um, so it's a very, it's, it's intense to have Saturn in Pisces because Pisces really, sorry, because Saturn really likes its boundaries, but then it's in the space of boundarylessness. Um, and so Pisces being the 12th sign or the 12th uh, house of the chart, it is actually uh, representative of endings and beginnings as well. So as one is part of the endings is the, the release, the shedding of the, the skin, or one could say the shedding of the shackles that prevent one from actually accessing divine consciousness. And in Violet's case, case this is a significant part of her um, uh, mystic rectangle. So it's going to be asking her to rise, not only in spiritual consciousness, but but integrating the esoteric as part of her spiritual path, okay? So, and integrating that into her own boundaries, okay? Adopting that for herself. So Saturn Pisces will draw circumstances from the past that draw us into those situations which require that we lose ourselves and die to be reborn into group consciousness. And that is um, Pisces, Neptune ruling the collective unconscious. So when you have Saturn in the second house, um, which is based upon, especially Saturn in the second house is sort of building um, one's reality based on uh, or accumulating, whether it's ideas or things or people based upon one's values, okay? And, but with Pisces there, and, it's been, and then also with Aquarius at the um, house cusp here, it's, it's building spiritual values, okay? So, and then Uranus in opposition to it, and as I talked about in this 10 minute presentation that I gave, Uranus is like the lightning bolt that just comes right in and crashes open with real sudden force. That from the unconscious that needs to come into conscious awareness. Um, and that first, which needs to be released, which needs to be shed, in order for that soul to evolve and to expand their boundaries to be more all-inclusive, okay? So it's really, I mean, the bottom line is that ultimately it's about shedding one's individual identity, which the person, personality and the ego just loves to sort of um, be attached to, to a much larger um, group consciousness. So, and then let's see if there's anything else here. Okay, so that's the Saturn Uranus. Oh, well then I, I can't fail to mention too that Uranus in Virgo, I'm having trouble with my, there we go. Uranus in Virgo really reinforces the idea of releasing conditioning because Virgo can be so wrapped up in, ah, oh, it's my fault. Uh, so every time the Neptunian consciousness, the divine consciousness tries to rise, and, and force open the personality that keeps one contained within an isolated unit, especially in the second house. The second house can be like, a, like one is in, you know, one has built a fortress of protection around oneself, but then Uranus comes in like a lightning bolt and just crack open, cracks open those walls so that the fortress will, will finally let go. And when you have Uranus in Virgo, it, tend, it tends to be wrapped uh, the, the sort of personality defenses and boundaries tend to be wrapped around, oh, shame and guilt, or I'm not good enough, uh, that kind of thing. So basically Uranus's purpose is to bring from the personal conscious, uh, sorry, let me re-say that, from the personal unconscious into conscious awareness, that which no longer serves the soul, all right? So that was the last thing I wanted to say. And then, of course, we have Pluto there uh, in Virgo. So, of course, uh, this volunteer is definitely part of the Pluto and Virgo um, generation, which one of their main themes is, I'm not ready, I'm not good enough. And the Pluto polarity point is pointing 
to the opposition, and this is reinforced by the retrograde motion pointing to the opposition of Pisces, um, to where whenever there is the shackles of shame, guilt, I'm not good enough, what's wrong with me, it's like cracking open into a sp spiritual awareness, a divine awareness, which is um, much, you know, the, the kind of, you know, uh, unconditional love for self and forgiveness for self, okay? That is what will dissolve those fortress walls. That's that opposition. Now, the other opposition is a nodal axis opposition. So that's very much a significant part of this with Venus, uh, the planetary archetype of Venus is part of it. So um, the south node in Capricorn, that reinforces, of course, Saturn um, is rules Capricorn. So we've, we've already got a connection here. Um, really, you know, the, the south node, uh, the uh, prior ego identity around, well, I'm just throwing this phrase out there, but it's kind of like something along the lines of, I've got to work myself to the bone. Uh, in order to go to heaven, I've got to work my butt off and sacrifice my home, my family, my heart, my emotional body. In other words, uh, South Node and Capricorn is very much capping, um, putting up the defenses against feeling one's emotions because it can be very inconvenient when one is trying to um, achieve uh, something significant in life. So the North Node, uh, reinforced with Venus and Cancer, is around owning one's own uh, emotional body, one's feelings. You know, so it's very much a life tra life's trajectory along those lines. Now moving along, because I'm I have 18 minutes for each person or 20 minutes for each person, I want to make sure that I cover the whole territory. Uh, so then we have you know Saturn uh, nicely trining uh, the North Node, and then we have. Uranus is trining the south node. And um, so the, let's see, starting with the Venus trine to Saturn. So uh, this is going to be the, um, uh, what is it? First quarter phase trine, okay? Now the north node is actually gonna be the, um, oh, I gotta have my chart here. It's gonna be the disseminating phase trine. So she's got an interesting duality going on here. But the uh, first quarter phase trine, yeah, is really, you know, Venus, you know, especially one's values, you know, it's like getting reoriented for her to mystically, spiritually evolve, you know, for this mystic rectangle to work. She really, this is a significant part of the rectangle, I think, is owning, the, and, and I'm saying that because it is conjunct the North Node in the seventh house. So it's it's owning her values of home, family, the heart, one's loved ones, you know, and but also, you know, Saturn and Pisces, it's nourishing herself and loving herself and surrounding herself with with emotional comforts. Um, and then and and then also especially surrounding herself with friends, with people, um, with others who also who support her, nourish her, um, and forgive her care for her deeply, okay? So that's an important part of it. Now the Uranus in the, um, is going to be, so, so since this is directly with the south node dynamic and you probably know this, the nodal axis goes in reverse. So it's gone around. So this is, uh, the south node is uh, very quickly, it is in its, um, so it's in the last trine so that again, I always forget the trine is in the disseminating phase. So. She's really uh, south node, the conditioning of the past really wants to be bro broken through, free in this lifetime. And part of this is also her as a dissemination, you know, she's come here to seed some of the, you know, the strengths, the, as a, let's say as a business person or whatever she has achieved in previous lives uh, around her public persona with Uranus there, she's in the disseminating phase trying, she's being asked to actually take those gifts, take those skills and, um, and distribute it, uh, kind of seed it into the collective. That's part of her work, okay? So, and it is conjunct the south node, whenever you have, sorry, the ascendance, whenever you have the south node conjunct the ascendance, so one is oftentimes attracting or magnetizing one's karmic past in order to release it uh, to the future, to the North Node. Um, okay, I think, 
the one thing, the last thing I want to say before I put Violet on board here, um, I just, I think it's important um, for Violet to be careful to not get caught up in victim consciousness. That's the Saturn in Pisces. It's like, uh, and, and also the get caught up to, into the desire to disappear, but, but in particular victim consciousness of why me? Um, that that's kind of like disappearing into the fortress walls. Um, so it's so instead of disappearing through feeling like a victim based on all the circumstances that are magnetized to her, um, she's being asked to um, actually spiritualize her consciousness. And with this mystic rectangle, I can imagine it will be just very powerful once those fortress walls start disappearing and dissipating. Also, another piece of it too, Violet, I just want to suggest, I don't know, I have no idea if this is an issue or not, but um, the fortress walls. So when, when, you, when one sort of is not feeling nourished from within or having the connection to something divine. And by the way, that's the other important piece of Saturn and Pisces is, is kind of like connecting the umbilical cord to the divine and being nourished through the divine rather than the expectation of being nourished. Um, it's spiritually nourished from other people or things in life or ideas in life. So, um, oh, I just lost my, so the, but the danger of when feeling sorry because it's such a difficult life, let's say, uh, is stuffing oneself with food. That's Saturn, Pisces in the second house, you know, as a way to stuff one's feelings rather than feeling the feelings and orienting towards God or the divine consciousness in order to, uh, funnel uh, the energy, the emotional energy. So, um, uh, Violet, I'd love to hear from you. Hi, thank you so much. That's, um, okay. that's uh, really amazing. I'm not sure where you would like me to start. <laughs> It will just yeah I, you know I hear you there's I am sure there's a lot you can say but whatever if you could just start with whatever uh, triggered you or and and whether you agree or you disagree it doesn't matter um, but whatever is the wherever the energy is at this moment from what I yeah, said yeah no, what you what you said is incredibly um, spot on I um, I've had a uh, <clears throat> it's been kind of a life of a lot of trauma and where I'm not allowed to really own anything. I mean, I say I'm not allowed to it. That's what it feels like to me. It feels there is a point at one point um, in my life where I said, you know, something else is going on here, either some past life memories. And this is before I, you know, I started to see a shaman yeah. um, uh -huh. to help, um, to help uh, heal uh, I contracted Lyme disease, but I didn't know it at the time. I just knew there was something, it felt very spiritual what was going on and that I needed a lot of healing in this area. So um, I started working with a shaman and uh, had worked a little bit with a shaman before and had done energy work and had tried a lot of alternative things. And that seems to be the thing that um, always opens the door to the healing. Um, it's never through conventional means and that's one of the things I've learned is that I can never <laughs> uh, follow the conventional path and I've tried I've banged my head against the wall to uh, try to fit in basically and it's just not it's just not my path mm -hmm. so I'm starting to do more um, you know you talked about the umbilical cord to the spiritual that um, that's it's spot on uh, I, I have started to come to not make decisions at all without saying, what would you like me to do? You know, where, what is my next step? Yes. If I need something, what do I need uh, now? How do I, in, whether it's financial or um, medical or uh, relationships or for someone else, um, and it's been a really, really hard thing to be able to let go of, you know, the religious and um, and the 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 well, it's conditioning of religion and family in the past. I've had to let go of everything. I've lost everything. Mm -hmm. I've lost everything through this. So, um, mm -hmm. if there's anything to make my face go in, <laughs> go into what I need to change, um, I've 
basically this disease and experiences in my life seem to be very external to me and it's very bizarre but it um uh, you have two more minutes okay so keep going sorry but it um uh it's always pointed to you know letting go it's basically had me disappear like even you know i stopped lost my ability to walk talk walk talk see uh you know i started losing my ability to to sleep um to eat Mm -hmm. all those abilities started going away just basic fundamental abilities and there is nothing for you except let go and be carried by whoever showed up at the time Mm-hmm. And I could still do those things, but they, they were, they were losing, they, I was losing them and I was disappearing literally mm-hmm. in front of my eyes. Mm-hmm. So that's been, um, that's been very difficult, <laughs> but it's also, uh, you know, I'm just astounded at, um, that there is a spiritual force that is welcoming me and I've always had a psychic um, kind of ability, mm-hmm. which has been very scary to me. Um, so I'm trying to understand a little bit more about how how to use that because it's so different than the talents you know I've mm-hmm. been given or that to be going in a direction. I was yeah. a musician and and mm-hmm. I can't do that anymore. So yeah, so that's kind of my. <laughs> Um, my contribution, I guess. Yeah, uh, thank you, Violet. And I, the only thing I want to add here, it's also what I see with that Saturn and Pisces, and then um, I it just, you know, surrendering to really, you know, just kind of like letting go and floating backwards, you know, those exercises where you, uh, where you, you know, you're standing, you have somebody behind you, and you're learning to trust, you know, by totally falling backwards and having somebody grab, you know, hold, you know, be there for your support. And so that's, that's all that Taurus. I mean, yeah, like the basic fundamentals of life, Taurian, you know, getting it to the essence of life, you know, just that the basic food, the basic needs of, of being human, but with, at, with the, you know, the spiritual foundation and finding your place within that. Uh, and, and yeah, and especially your, you know, the sensitivity that you talk about, you know, yeah, finding, reconnecting with that um, to help nourish you as well. And I get angel, I get repeating numbers all the time too. Like there, um, I was in New York City during September 11 and um, for a year, my clock would go off at 11 minutes after the hour. I'd wake up at 9-11 every day. And this was also wow. when a year was, it, it was, it was, it's still happening, but it's changing. It's shifting from to all ones and fours. Wow. And I've saw, and it's not just the clock. It's things on the side of the road. It's I wake up in the middle of the night and turn the TV on and there's a psychic on the television and said, what does nine and 11 mean to you? And, and it's just bizarre. My clock radio would, it was an atomic clock would go off at 12, 11 every day <laughs> by itself and i finally threw it out because it was getting so <laughs> annoying but but there's strange things like that happen all the time and um i meet people um i don't uh, anything that i do myself to try to get uh, to a certain spot never works out but if i say i would really like to go here is this where you'd like me to go or this who you'd like me to meet or this is the help you need me to have then boom at some point something shows up whether it's money mm-hmm. or people or um it's yeah. a it's been a very strange um you said trust fall this my whole life has been mm-hmm. one big fat friggin trust fall <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's taking you, it's like, it sounds like life is taking you down to the bare bones minimum over and over and over again, uh, so that you can surrender even deep, more deeply. Is there a way and, to get out of that? <laughs> <Is> there- <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, is, that is, so the Saturnian, you know, the Saturnian cycles, because um, it, it figures so prominently here. Uh, anyway, is, uh, and then with Mercury uh, ruling uh, the Virgo, the moon. Anyway, I, uh, 
I, okay, so what I, I just distracted myself. Um, I, I really, I, I just trust that, first of all, putting out that question, what is, is the way out? However, I, th I think it's just over and over and over again, surrendering to something deeper and getting, even when you think you've gone to the bare bones minimum, minimum possible, like let's say if you lost your home or, you know, God forbid, uh, lost everything, it's just like finding the juice, finding the essence, finding the mysticality um, below all of this. And then you're mentioning the patterns, you know, the, the constant repetition of patterns, talking about patterns. I mean, you got the mystic rank, rectangle, which is the esoteric. So it's like you're being asked to sink into the esoteric uh, fountain. I don't even want to say, yeah, fountain underneath the foundation of life. Wow. Okay. And building from there. And, and you've got plenty of building energy, Sun and Taurus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter and Taurus. And, and it's like building, uh, you know, the security, the safety uh, from the place of the emotional body too. And that, that's, that's really what you're reowning is the emotional body. But then also on a deeper level, finding the spiritual connection through the emotional body. Okay. From the fourth house. So, okay, we should probably move on uh, to the next. Uh, Thank you. And so feel, much. Oh, you're very, very, very welcome, uh, Violet. And always feel free uh, if you want to email me any questions later or anything. And uh, it'd be interesting to see the other thing too. I think you might have mentioned that you know other people with uh, mystic rectangles. Uh, finding out if they yeah, are also sorry. attuned. Yeah, if they're attuned to patterns in their lives, like you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if they're having similar, not the same, you know, numbers or anything like that, but finding patterns just popping up over and over and over again for them. I'll, I'll, I'll look at that with them. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, it's like life continuously saying, I'm here. I'm supporting you. <laughs> Let go. <laughs> Even deeper. Good. That's excellent. Yeah. That's excellent news, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Thanks, Violet. Bye-bye. Um, okay, the odd. Uh, this is a so <sighs> taking a deep breath here. Moving uh, from the mystic rectangle to the odd, uh, also called the finger of God or the finger of fate. So this is uh, we have to kind of break down the odd to really get a sense for this. Uh, the important part here is the um, well. Let me back up. So this is the odd is composed of three planets and one of the planets is going to be exactly opposite the midpoint of the other two planets. And in addition to that, um, two of the planets um, are going to be in an in conjunct phase, and this will be, or quincunx, um, I'll go back and forth using both terms, and they both mean the same thing, So, but it's basically 150 degrees. And so one of the in conjuncts will be in gibbous phase, uh, to this, um, ape or this is actually called the apex planner planet. And then the other planet will also be in gibbous phase, but it's going to be in a full um, completion mode or full phase relationship to the apex planet. So let me just restate that, state that again. So this is a 150 degree relationship between these two planets, and these two planets also have a 150 degree relationship. The first two planets, it is um, in the gibbous phase. The second two planets will be in the full phase. Very different energies, but the energies are always about adjustments, okay? So the first um, gibbous phase is around internal readjustments, okay? Gibbous phase in conjunct, constantly adjusting, self, you know, tur turning the mind inward, analyzing and adjusting based on um, what ones come up with based on one's circumstances. Now the other in conjunct is based on, uh, is, is the feedback comes from society. It comes from culture. It comes from engaging with the world. And the feedback that one get, gets from the world, uh, it's basically kind of more of a social humility um, and more of a Scorpio kind of quality where the world would give one feedback that tells them, okay, you need to just adjust a little bit here, you need to tweak that a little bit there, and, and so on. And so the re resolution node, if you will, I don't think it's called that, it's actually, it is the apex planet is, is this planet here. 
And this planet really uh, is significant in the yod it, because it gives the focus. Um, and uh, yeah, it, uh, it really allows one to focus one's energy, one's mind in order to resolve the two in conjuncts, okay? Um, all right, and then uh, Stephen Forrest also mentions this looks like a rocket. That's one way. It's a good way, or an arrow. Okay, with the apex planet as the the how to funnel the energy to move the sort of the humility, um, the quincunx humility, both uh, personal, internal, and external through society. Okay, moving along. So uh, we have Kimberly here. Hi, Kimberly, and she's got a yod in her chart. Uh, actually, she has two yods in her chart. So I'm going to talk about the first one first. And uh, so her apex planet is Venus. And let me get my notes out here on Kimberly. So the apex planet is Venus. And um, then, so as the planets move, we're, okay, and then the other two planets here in sextile to each other, uh, always the odds have the sextile, is going to be, um, so this will be the uh, gibbous phase in conjunct between Pluto and Venus, and then Venus to Saturn is the uh, full phase in conjunct. So yeah, have that there. The, the one thing, other one other thing before I talk about the qualities of the archetypes that I want to mention too is that um, both Hand and uh, Robert Hand and Stephen Forrest kind of give different uh, degrees, but it's important to when you're looking at yods, you, it's easy to see yods in a chart. You know, you, wherever you see two in conjuncts, usually there is a sextile connecting them, and and you've got a yod uh, again. It's the finger of fate, so it's a it's a major pattern. But the thing to keep in mind is that in the sextile or the opposition point of the apex planet really should not be, um, Robert Hand says, no more than one to one and a half degrees uh, from the midpoint of the sextile planets, in this case, Saturn and Pluto. Uh, and Stephen Forrest gives two to two and a half degrees. So I was really working with um, just, I think, uh, like one to one and a half degree differences here. Um, actually, Kimberly has two more yods, <laughs> um, but we're not going to talk about it, first of all, because we don't have time. We're going to talk about two yods rather than four yods, but also the other two yods, they're, they're wider. Um, it's over two degrees um, width between the sextile planets, so I just really wanted to focus on the ones that are the strongest here. So, and Kimberly, it'll be interesting to hear your experience in life uh, as far as how these yods show up. Okay, so starting with the Pluto-Venus relationship, uh, she's Pluto in Libra, as we know, you know, Pluto in Libra is part of the generational dynamic of uh, working to heal one's relationship to self in relationships. So it's almost like Pluto and Libra, it's like the center of gravity of oneself is outside of oneself and it's, it's in the other person and one is constantly looking to feedback from the other person on how to act, how to behave, how to be. Um, and that has given, because her Pluto and Libra is in the fifth house, a sense of insecurity around her, um, her creativity, uh, fifth house cre creativity or creative self-expression. She's got it, st uh, the Pluto is stationary retrograde, so it's like, um, that's like an explanation point, uh, if you will. And whenever something is retrograde, and I'm including stationary retrograde, it always points to its opposite very strongly. Now, as, as evolutionary astrologers, we know that uh, the Pluto polarity point uh, is, is very important for um, you know, pressuring us to our evolutionary intention. So, but because hers is stationary retrograde, like it's like an explanation point, like really focusing on the Aries dynamic in uh, the Aquarian 11th house archetype. Uh, so moving from uh, sort of personal insecurity in relationships or feeling kind of compromised uh, in relationships to having the courage, Aries, to stand up for herself in, in especially in groups. Um, but go, and also going from subjectivity, it's, it's not about me, 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 uh, to be, be learning how to be more objective, or instead of being caught up in the drama of relationships, learning how to kind of 
separate and differentiate and observe rather than being caught up in the drama. So that's the Pluto. And then, so Venus rules Libra. Um, so, so there is, and then Venus in Pisces, it would be very much around the spiritual um, component, but let's, since it's um, in conjunct uh, Pluto, I'm going to give it a negative inflection because Pluto is here and whatever is connected to Pluto, it's here to evolve. That's what we're desiring to, to do is to evolve it. So it's saying her, her she, Venus in Pisces it, tending to get lost. Uh, in some ways, it's similar to Saturn in Pisces, but the, in the sense of really losing self, uh, having really lost oneself in relationship, in relationships, um, and, and kind of mentally disappearing or disappearing. Okay. So, um, so this is part of the, um, you know, Saturn in relationship to, in the gibbous phase, it's like releasing, sort of like an emphasis on releasing karma in relationships here, okay? So maybe having had a series of relationships that sort of came in and went very quickly. Um, so uh, that's Venus in conjunct relationship, gibbous in conjunct. Um, Let's see if there's anything else there. Oh, okay. And then, oh, and then the other thing I just wanted to say too. So uh, Pluto pointing at Pluto polarity point and having its stationary retrograde pointing to friends. So, you know, developing a, a strong network of friends and, and learning how to be an individual, the Aries, uh, taking risk um, around being herself, Aries, with her friends, with a group of friends. And it'd be great, you know, being surrounded by like-minded friends so that she'll feel more comfortable um, asserting herself. Um, okay, so then the other one. So here's the gibbous phase, Venus in, uh, not gibbous phase, but full phase uh, in conjunct relationship to Saturn. So Saturn and Leo, um, really, it, this shows the boundaries around uh, sort of, or conditioning around the Leo, I'm not creative. Um, I can say Saturn in Leo. I have Saturn in the fifth house. It's sort of like, well, if I'm going to have fun, it's got to, uh, I got to learn something. And I've, I've sort of picked this up because it's in the third house. You know, in order for me to have fun, I need to be learning something while I'm having fun. Like instead of watching a movie with just pure drama, it would be more watching a documentary. Um, so, but the Saturn in Leo is learning how to have fun and, and working towards that. Um, and, um, and then retrograde motion is pointing to the um, Aquarian again, uh, sort of learning objectivity, objectivity, sorry, and stepping back and um, getting a, a wider perspective, ninth house. Okay, so rather than getting caught up in the individual diversities, moving towards the, the bigger picture and looking for the patterns and kind of separating herself from the drama of life. So there's a lot here, uh, learning objectivity. And uh, so then we have the sextile between Saturn and Pluto. Um, so we can see so this is, ooh, exactly, so see five, six, seven, sextile. So the um, sextile would be, so this is last quarter phase. Saturn is last quarter phase to Pluto. So she's been working this dy dynamic for a long time. She's really, uh, you know, Saturn in Leo letting go of also the same thing of karma as she's preparing to end her cycle of the Saturn-Pluto dynamic. And the Saturn-Pluto dynamic is empowering herself in the world, okay? So for her to be more empowered in the world, it is around uh, gaining greater objectivity, not taking things so personally. But then uh, there we have the Venus and Pisces apex uh, planet. So, um, and probably the reason why many of all of you are on this call is getting a, a, a larger uh, spiritual understanding of things. So we're kind of seeing the same thing here, but this is more focused on, um, you know, reorienting one's values towards spiritual values uh, and also showing up um, in uh, one's professional career and developing, you know, working on being interesting, uh, Kimberly, to see, you know, what you're doing, what kind of work you're doing in the world. Um, it definitely needs to be working with groups and uh, with a spiritual orientation and maybe helping um, groups of people working towards realigning spiritually uh, together. 
um, which often brings in sort of love and compassion and uh, the beauty of things. So, um, and then, you know, Pluto in the fifth house talking about beauty. It's like, this is a lot of creating beauty. Pluto in the fifth house is like in Libra, it's like, maybe being an artist in a previous life and having been, been died because of one's artistry and for uh, one having the courage to create such beauty um, as an artist uh, and the self-orientation of artists and where this lifetime is, is um, really re-owning your connection to beauty and love in a very public kind of way. So that would definitely, and there certainly would be that sense of finger of fate, like I've, I've got to do this from hell or high water or, or feeling like you have a special destiny to do this. And somehow, you know, I actually had seen this earlier, it's like bringing your art out into the world. Um, Kimberly, when I hear from you, I'd be interested in hearing about what you are doing for your work in the world. Oops, uh, I'm about to lose my earphones. Actually, I've got some notes here. And then I'm going to point out here, so I'm sure this does show up. So the second yod is um, the apex point is actually her ascendant with Gemini. And this really brings, so the, um, in, okay, I got to back up here. So when, whenever we're rotating or moving any of the um, four quadrants, any you know, whether it's the ascendant or midheaven, descendant or nadir, we go in reverse motion, just like we do uh, with the nodal axis. So her, so rather than going in that direction, I'm going to go in this direction. So Uranus is in gibbous phase in conjunct to the ascendant, and then her Mercury is in the more the you know social phase, the full phase of uh, to the the ascendant. So. Mercury ruling the ascendant is very important uh, that she is working in the world and connecting with society and um, actually having the courage, the Mars conjunct Mercury uh, to build um, to build something, to build whether it's an organi organization or or to create um, uh, to organize in sort of a chaotic kind of environment, whether one is working with sort of the disenfranchised, the poor, or to people with who have been traumatized, you know, working for an institutional structure that um, creates um, security and support for those who've been traumatized. I mean, that, that would be one way that it would show up, but this really emphasizes the, the mercury and, and having the courage to speak. Um, yeah, and yeah, having the courage to speak her voice. That's interesting. Saturn is in Leo in the third house. So there's, there's a strong emphasis on communication here. Uh, of course, Mars uh, conjunct the Mercury. Um, there, there, that really intensifies it and the importance of having the courage to speak up against institutional structures and maybe even feeling, you know, kind of fearful or disempowered around potentially uh, speaking up against institutions. Um, but the, the, the apex point here is saying, do it, do it anyway. Um, so, and then uh, Mercury's balsamic phase to Mars. So it's like finishing up some last stuff around um, conditioning that is holding back her voice as in also envisioning the future of how uh, she can speak, write, communicate, uh, in ways that really serve her soul and will build her self-confidence, uh, her intellectual, her mental self-confidence in the world. So, is there anything? So, and then, if, oh yeah, Uranus um, will definitely, uh, it, as I talked about before, it will bring things, especially Uranus and Scorpio, bring things from the personal unconscious, like trauma, for example, the scorpionic material, uh, to help shift things. So if you're suddenly getting thoughts or ideas that just feel very disturbing, it's, it's, you're being asked to look at that and to really integrate it and to do something about that with Mars conjunct Mercury. Um, so, but the Uranus sextile Mercury really gives a, a strong intellectual um, mental focus, almost to the point of brilliance, I can imagine. Um, this is uh, new phase sextile, 
um, yeah, or crescent phase sextile. So it's kind of new, but still, um, still very important. So really trusting this Uranian impulse, you know, whatever comes from the lunches. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's uh, my two minute uh, timer. And so Kimberly, I would love to hear from you. Okay. That was um, really just like Violet said when um, she was giving you feedback, very much spot on. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, very spot on. Uh, it's, it's always interesting to me because especially what you were saying about the Mercury Mars is I do, I always, you know, as I was getting um, insight and listening to your words, I was like, I knew what I wanted to share, but, and I knew what you were talking about, but I didn't want to share it because this is scary to, to speak. Communications mm -hmm. are always involved in crisis and I'm always learning that. Um, I'm always, after every crisis, because I do often feel like I've been in constant crisis, although I, I've, as I've gotten older, I notice a theme where it always brings me back around to that, um, having the courage to initiate difficult conversations, mm -hmm. to be objective, look at the bigger picture, and then bring in the, the compassion and the healing. And that Saturn in the third house has been something that I've you know, found challenging, but it, it is, you're right. Like what I do for fun is I watch documentaries. I take yeah. classes. <laughs> I, I get it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean that, that's fun to me. My husband totally yeah. laughs at me, but mm -hmm. um, so, but as I get older, I start to realize how that everything that I've learned and kind of, I've been filling my tool bag and through every crisis, how I've kind of opened up more of my, I'm able to make the connection and have that objective perspective and see how it fits into a, a much larger picture and more of a spiritual sense mm -hmm. as well. Then I, um, I see how it all kind of has been for a purpose, how it is all mm -hmm. connected. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very much. And but yeah, what I Kimberly, I, I want to say, you know, I totally forgot you had uh, sent me some of your environmental conditioning. And I just, I, if I could add here, um, I'd forgotten about this as I was talking about it, but you are actually a psychic tarot card reader uh, and have your own business online. And that's like perfect. It's like, wow, that's so Aquarius Pisces, you know, combining those two together and then having your own business, the Capricornian um, part of it too. Yeah, uh, it's definitely my life's work. And it, it is evolving. I noticed that I, I feel drawn to adding more, um, to writing more articles and sharing in that way, the communications. Yeah. And yeah. then I also have, um, I have a big goal, um, which feels related to my yards is, you know, to eventually, even it's one of those missions where I feel like if, even if it takes me my whole life, I can be patient mm -hmm. and I can let everything come together for it because I want to, I have a, a big dream for a, a nonprofit organization that would be an institute, you know, an institution, but a, a totally new way of heal, providing healing and spe specifically trauma healing and mm -hmm. uh, kind of incorporates all of that. That I think is uh, absolutely, and that's, you know, with your Saturn in the, um, I always forget the, so the last quarter phase to Pluto. So yeah, you, you know, taking authority, uh, you know, um, for yourself, uh, and then in combination with the Mercury Mars, you know, speaking your truth um, and, and doing it your way. <laughs> you have no choice but to do it your way. Uh, and, and then also uh, stationary retrograde Mercury is, you know, pointing to the second house with the cancer element as well as like, again, you know, just like the violet bringing in the heart, bringing in, you know, fueling the Capricornian structures, which can feel so alienating um, and isolating. You know, you're working as part of a team, you know, for a project, but there, the, the loss of the cancer, um, 
and then in the work, you know, especially if it's an institution, a nonprofit working for people who are experiencing trauma is helping them to make sense of their trauma from a spiritual or esoteric perspective uh, with your strongly intuitive ability. You know, the moon conjunct Neptune here in Sagittarius. Yeah, definitely. And it, it's funny that you say it. it has to be my way because I do the Libran thing and I let people, you know, observe and I watch and then that's when the crisis hits and then I have to be the one to do something to yeah. fix things or heal things or, you know, whatever. And reorganize the structure and, and uh, bring uh, order to the chaos, Mercury, Mars, but, but doing it from a spiritual perspective, right? Yeah, exactly. Doing Always. it from your way. Yeah. 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 And that yeah. Neptune moon is square Venus is my <laughs> Achilles yeah. heel. There you go. I learned a lot from that for sure. Mm -hmm. I, things are never as fantastical and beautiful as mm -hmm. I. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I believe that. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can imagine you can drift off into, you know, la la land uh, quite um, easily. Excuse me, Christina, yes. in order yes, to Linda. all the volunteers in, we're going to have to speed Move up, along. please. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Uh, moving along. Thanks, Linda. I appreciate the, the heads up. And uh, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, we could talk for thank a little about charts. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Next pattern is the kite. So the kite is a grand trine uh, with one planet in opposition and sextile to the two others. Where's my cursor? There it is. Okay, so here's the uh, planetary opposition that we see in the kite. Okay, oops, shoot, sorry. Uh, okay, I gotta use my finger here instead. Um, okay, so we have the grand trine, and then we have two planets in opposition. Uh, the This is actually called the head of the kite or the top of the kite, and then this is the tail of the kite, okay? And so the head of the kite is going to be sextiling uh, these two planets that are in trine, that are part of this trine, all right? So basically, you're looking for a grand trine and an opposition. And usually, you, the opposition will be uh, in sextile or bring the sextile in as well. So uh, Anastasia, uh, did I pronounce that again? Um, I hope I got that right this time. No, it's Anastasia. Anastasia, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I really thank you. Okay, so we've got the grand trine here, but before I talk about, uh, well, it, yeah, we're going to talk about the grand trine, but then we have the opposition between the moon and Mercury. Now, what's interesting with your uh, kite here is that the grand trine is, um, is in uh, fire signs, right? And then your opposition is in the cardinal modality. So that's a lot of intensity. <laughs> um, so, but going back to the grand trine, you know, a, a trine in fire will give the individual the ability to, you know, to kind of radiate warmth, enthusiasm, enjoyment, um, the, the joy of living, if you will, um, and also supporting a, a strong self orientation. Now, before I move on, I'm going to have to, unfortunately, my uh, AirPods are about to die. So I've got to, I'm sorry about this. I'm going to have to take a minute just to um, stop the share, which means getting my cursor. There we go. For one second and shift out of uh, my cursor down. Have I lost you guys yet? I know I'm going too soon. We're still here. <laughs> okay. Okay. The problem with dual screens is sometimes getting the cursor on the right screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'm sharing my screen again. And are we back to the one um, Anastasia's um, chart, one chart here? Yes, but we need the full screen. Oh, I. Hmm. 
screen. Okay. So you're not seeing the full screen. So let's try this one. How's, no, that can't be it. Sorry. Uh, let's try this one. That's it. Okay, you're seeing the full screen. All right, great. It's not exactly full, but it's full enough. It's, it's good enough. Okay, so... Okay, uh, so we have the grand trine and then the opposition. So the grand trine being in fire and then the moon in Aries and the Mercury in uh, uh, Libra opposition, cardinal, so intense energy, strong motivation. Um, however, the, the issue with the grand trine in fire is that there, uh, it could be, if, if it's just the grand trine in fire without the opposition would be, um, just uh, kind of acting without thinking, speaking without thinking, doing without thinking, um, and, and being unreflective. But then we have this, uh, talk about unreflective, we have this opposition with the moon in Aries, which reflects, it mirrors. But Aries tends to be instinctive again, and, and just sort of, you know, it runs by emotional instincts. Um, so, but it is in the third house around reflecting. So I would say with um, Anastasia, it, the soul, you know, just kind of, I mean, cardinal fire is all about learning from doing and then self-reflecting, you know, through the mirror of the life that you've created or the circumstances that you've created, um, uh, that you've self-created. And then the Mercury and Libra is connecting with people who, uh, you know, getting feedback from people. Um, and yeah, and sort of responding and learning and growing from their feedback. Um, so I'm being, having a lot of fire in my chart myself. I totally get that dynamic. So, and then kind of also, since this is ninth house um, energy with the sun and Libra, Mercury and Libra and Pluto and Scorpio, there is really um, sort of getting the bigger picture through engaging with others and uh, very, and seeing the patterns. Like let's say, you know, for instance, Moon and Aries, you jump into a relationship and then into the next relation, the next relationship. And then um, learning about relationships through obviously jumping into your own relationships. But then um, let's say, you know, studying psychology uh, to understand the patterns across all relationships that other people are experiencing in addition to yourself, okay? So uh, this is a nice, you know, trine. So the moon is in the uh, full phase trine to Venus. Yeah, coming on to there. And then the moon is, let me get something in the way I can't see. Oh, I can't see it because it, huh, and my cursor disappears every time I go up there. Sorry, I can't see what those, it looks like, oh yeah, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Um, so the moon in the, uh, it would be the trine of the first quarter phase trine. So it's, it's almost like, you know, that, that 12th house, of, especially 12th house Saturn, um, it's, it's like coming in with belief systems, Sagittarius, coming in with the truth that you, you've, um, and bringing past life unconscious beliefs that you're that you're totally expanding in this life. Um, this really feels like a, a very a life about you, <laughs> and you getting into just diving into life and experiencing life. Of course, Mars and Aries, Aries reinforcing this uh, to learn about the diversity of life, and then pulling all your experiences together into patterns um, in order to break the conditioning, um, whether it's a religious conditioning or whatever the beliefs are that are constraining, okay? And then Uranus completely liberates you from that into seeing, um, kind of jumping outside of the, the walls of actual of society and seeing things, you know, in some ways being a visionary, seeing things that go beyond um, what traditional cultural conditioning has taught you in the past. And you're, it's just like enthusiastically diving into life in this lifetime and getting total support for that. Uh, with this kite dynamic. So um, I'm going to ask Anastasia uh, your feedback thus far. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. I've, 
I've never really, uh, in the past, like, I don't know, like since I've been studying my moon in Aries, I kind of started relating to it more, but I've never really related to the whole like fire signs jump into okay. them before they, you know, before they do them. I always think that my Capricorn ascendant like mm. really locks that down pretty yeah. tightly. Mm -hmm. um, and then my Libra sun is like, is like even more like, no, no, we have to be respectable. I like, can't just dive into it. But um, I do think the, um, the idea about the patterns, I mean, I think like, I do remember when I was younger, um, I definitely did the Libra sun thing where I was, you know, constantly seeking out relationships and such uh, with people, both friendships and romantically that, um, you know, I had a hard time just kind of being on my own. Um, wow. And I mean, I think part of that is uh, the family dynamic that I grew up in was very codependent. And so, you know, part of it, I think was like that conditioning um that's my baby in the background it sounds like you have a little one yeah yeah um so yeah but i do um i do think the the 12th house stuff um i mean i definitely could see the you know like i'm really into past life regression so like uh, uh -huh. okay. kind of kind of seeing how and that's actually brought a lot of hi um that's brought a lot of uh like insight for me about just kind of yeah past life beliefs that don't serve me anymore mm -hmm. so yeah so are you an artist at all with jupiter in the fifth house and no i mean okay. um fire I, uh, yeah, I'm not really, like, I write, but it's not really, I don't really do any, like, fine art type stuff. Okay, well, writing, absolutely. Actually, that's a nice outlet for your energy there, is writing the truth that you see, having the courage to write what you see, the Mercury and Libra, and bringing beauty to it, bringing balance, bringing harmony to it, uh, it allowing you to see the larger picture there. Yeah. Yeah, and bring in the spiritual perspective, North Node and Pisces, uh, ruled by Neptune, Capricorn. Yeah, I mean, I, I do, um, I, I do like writing about spiritual things, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I've done some writing about astrology before, so. Mm -hmm. I, boy, I think that, that would be a great outlet for you, um, really, a, a very satisfying one. Yeah, no, it's something that I definitely want to keep uh, working on. And then the sun trying Jupiter too, sun and Libra. I just, I keep, I remember when I was looking at this earlier, just I kept feeling like you're a creative artist in some way. And, and the importance of communicating what moves through this opposition here. Um, you know, it comes out of your instinct, even though, even though you don't know what you're going to say, what the next word is. Uh, it, and, and, then, and then allowing it to flow. Um, okay, cool. That's, that's good. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anastasia, anything else? Or sh uh... Yeah. You want to get involved? Uh, <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for uh, looking at that. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, the next uh, one we're going to be looking at uh, the volunteer who has both the yod and the kite. And I'm going to show you real quickly, but then I'm going to go back to it. So here's we're going to first start on the yod, but then you see the kite there overlaid upon the yod and seeing how the apex point uh, for the yod is, I mean, it's, it's perfectly aligned uh, with the tail of the kite. So going back to just focusing on the yacht. So her midheaven here being the apex point is very important. And again, um, sort of, if, I just want to remind you that we're, I'm going to, whenever I'm looking at aspects, phases and aspects between uh, planets and um, the house cusp, I've, you've got to move backwards with the house cusp. So 
Uh, this is, so the midheaven is actually in the uh, uh, gibbous phase in conjunct uh, to her Uranus. And then the, the midheaven is in a uh, full phase in conjunct to her moon. And then of course the moon Uranus uh, in sextile to each other. And she's got, and this is what creates actually the kite, is she's got the Neptune in opposition to her midheaven right along her nadir. So interesting dynamic there. And um, I, again, I have a pop-up window that is hiding some planets in the 12th house, which doesn't help because I can't see what's in the 12th house at all in this chart. Christina? Yes. Uh, 12th house, she has the North Node in Leo. Okay. Uh, Jupiter and Mars in Virgo. North Node in Leo. Ah, Jupiter. And Mars in Virgo. And okay. 23 Virgo ascendant. Yeah, I see the ascendant. I see the Saturn there conjunct the ascendant. So I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so. Mercury, uh, I'm going to be focusing on the midheaven here right now. So Merc because it is so significant actually for both um, patterns, where is her Mercury? Mercury is in Pisces. Uh, it's interesting how much Pisces each one of you has here. So Mercury is in Pisces, uh, ruling the midheaven, her career. It's in the, first of all, you know, that tells us that she has a highly intuitive mind. But it's in the, in the second house makes it very practical and down to earth. And uh, I don't mean to say the cliche, but it's definitely this be here now. I mean, it's a great phrase for Rebecca, um, really focusing on the here and the now and finding a spiritual orientation through being here and now, uh, and also finding and creating peace in her daily activities. Um, but the other piece of the sixth house too, Mercury is very, very significant in our chart. And um, that brings the integration of the body and the mind for health and wellness, okay? Um, and we're going to, so, let me think here, what was I gonna do with this? So the, the Uranus and Scorpio, also being in the third house, which is ruled by Mercury. So Uranus bringing the personal unconscious into conscious awareness will have a tendency to bring material, potentially traumatic material from the deep unconscious into a personal conscious awareness, okay? So uh, it's important with the apex point being ruled by Mercury to process it um, that the, the deep, um, so the psychological material uh, that, that comes into conscious awareness to process it uh, from a spiritual perspective, but also from a very practical here and now kind of perspective. Okay, so there, this does bring a lot of uh, self-analysis uh, with the gibbous phase um, in conjunct. And then the moon in relationship to Mercury's rulership of the midheaven. Uh, moon in Capricorn is, is another Capricorn. It's just very much um, sort of the, the, the capped emotions reinforced by being in the fourth house. Um, so Mercury, uh, so actually Uranus is very helpful in helping to uh, transform uh, the conditioning layers, the Saturnian conditioning layers that um, prevent her from, you know, experiencing her emotions or accessing her emotions or, and, and also, you know, Uranus and Scorpio can bring up a lot of fearful material. And then the moon in Capricorn, is, its instinct is to suppress it. So the Mercury in Pisces is a great sort of funnel of energy to help um, channel that energy and to process the energy through the Mercury and in, in, uh, in Pisces. Now, keeping in mind, this is this is a sextile relationship. So um, I remember Stephen Forrest saying, you know, this is just the natural sextile. It's a very inspirational sextile. It's, of course, it's a positive energy. It inspires. It stimulates. It makes energy move. But with just the sextile on its own, it doesn't know where to go. Okay, that energy is like, okay, it's inspired. It's like falling in love with something, but it doesn't know what it's falling in love with. And super excited about something, but not sure what it's excited about. So the, um, the apex of the yacht really helps the, to funnel the energy. In her case, it would be the Mercury and Pisces in the sixth house. 
So a way to funnel that energy in the sixth house is through the mental, physical, body interface, uh, through health and wellness, you know, paying attention to, you know, how does your physical body feel? And um, very much Virgo energy is very much processing, um, you know, it, we're integrating, if you will, um, or, you know, sort of purifying, detoxifying uh, the sort of intense emotions that suddenly come from the unconscious uh, and then <clears throat> uh, and then integrating it into uh, the mind-body interface. <clears throat> so part of the Mercury in Pisces is learning a, a deep sensitivity um, to her own sort of physical container in life as she orients and sort of goes about her daily activities in life or in um, the sixth house kind of thing. So um, that in itself kind of giving, even though the material that comes forth can be terrifying, uh, bringing the spiritual perspective to help, to help bring uh, the, you know, the moon and Capricorn desire to have structure, to have form, uh, to bring security um, and to make sense out of chaos. So I think her Mercury in Pisces is just so, so very important here uh, for driving. Um, to, to help release the conditioning that is capping the emotional body. So, yeah, so the question is, what is the spiritual orientation towards the trauma that created uh, fragmentation in order to help uh, reintegrate the mental fragments into the body? And the reason why I say that is we've got the sun, we got the south node um, in balsamic phase to the sun, in the sixth house. And so uh, sun in Aquarius, south node in Aquarius can be mental fragmentation. Um, and then Uranus and Scorpio would say that the fragmentation is due to trauma, which it usually always is anyway. And so, but the purpose with these being in the sixth house is to integrate the mental fragmentation into the physical body. Uh, and her uh, Mercury and Pisces can really help with the spiritual perspective that um, is, you know, reassuring, that brings security, safety, support, unconditional love. So, um, okay, I think, let's see, yeah. Oh, right, and I can't forget this. Of course, Neptune in between the Ur Ur Uranus and Moon is also bringing uh, the, the higher spiritual perspective. You see, there's a lot of mental energy here between the her third house and then um, uh, and then Neptune and Sagittarius. So we're always bringing the intense emotionals into sort of a larger spiritual perspective. So adding the um, kite pattern here with again Neptune is the the head of the the kite. So this is the apex point. Uh, for her, and then the tail being the Mercury in Pisces. So Neptune and Sagittarius being a real uh, driving force for spiritual understanding, for broadening perspective, always, always, always desiring to do so. Um, and I think the importance here, is, or being so much, in, it, it, so much with the Mercury, sixth house, Aquarius, Pisces is around uh, uh, physical, mental, and spiritual integration. And I think there's going to be one last thing. So, uh, yeah, so the, of course the grand trine here is in uh, air signs. Oh, that's that's where the mental orientation came from, actually. So this can be very, very, very supportive, being a grand trine. Uh, and then the Neptune in opposition to the midheaven, um, helping to provide the tension, to 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 provide the the impetus to break out of. Um, the sort of the air um, sort of challenge, if you will, or shadow of a grand trine in air <clears throat> is constantly learning um, without going anywhere, okay? So, but Neptune and Sagittarius would really bring, okay, how do we integrate all of this information together? <clears throat> or how do I integrate the mental fragments into the physical body in a way that's spiritually nourishing? All right, Rebecca, thoughts? feedback. Hi. Yes, here, let me keep this going. Okay. So I was taking notes all the way through, but there was so much there that I didn't manage to get 
everything, but like so many people said, it was very spot on. Um, and if there's anything I missed, it was probably still mm -hmm. spot on. Um, so yeah, that was fabulous. Thank you. Um, first off, also, thank you so much for doing this and for squeezing me in last minute. I appreciate sure. that. Um, yeah. um, and the, um, uh, what you brought in about the uh, when you're looking at an angle, how that reverses the phase, um, mm -hmm. that actually was really helpful because the the sort of collective humiliation versus personal humiliation, mm -hmm. it actually made a lot more sense um, in terms of how those play out for me in my life. Um, so yeah, the way you the, talked about that Mercury is very much the case um, that need to kind of find peace in my daily activities. Um, the idea of, um, yeah, unconscious material process from a spiritual perspective and, and this sort of like, I feel like it's a lot of my, my dharma or whatever. I feel this sense of kind of processing collective unconscious stuff and sort of bringing it through my own life experience and and always always needing i have this compulsive need to bring in the big picture what's the larger perspective what's the larger spiritual perspective um and and yeah sort of try and find all of the the threads that move through everything and almost feeling like it's like i need to process it through my body somehow um whatever is happening collectively like it all sort of comes in and i'm 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 sort of this inner vortex kind of trying to put all the pieces together and make sense of it all um and yeah definitely a lot of self-analysis um you talked about the capped emotions and the layers of blocks i wrote what suppress me yes <laughs> yes um i know despite all the compulsive self-analysis uh, and like you said there's a lot of block there and then with that grand shrine uh in air there's definitely um a lot of you know there can be a lot of kind of getting lost in the thoughts of, and and not moving anywhere and as i've kind of been trying to lean into more of a, a spiritual perspective and also um more of bringing things into my body needing kind of an engine to help me move so i'm not just you know like looking at astrology aspects all the time or whatever and, and sort of getting lost in the mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I realized yeah. for example, that Jungian analysis is not a good type of therapy for me. I'll just get totally <laughs> bogged down in the yeah. mental aspect. Yeah. Um, and something that's been so huge for me has been more of an embodied type of um, therapy or, or sort of relating to myself of really learning to pay close attention to what is going on in my body. Yeah. What is, how, how is my PTSD? Um, how is that operating right now? What are the emotions that are happening within me? How can I set up boundaries around that? Um, and, and not even like needing to dig in and be like, okay, what is this bringing up? What does it mean? But just sort of letting it be held. Like, okay, this is what it is right now in my body. Um, and a big drive for me over the last few years has been learning to pay attention to how I'm feeling physically, even health-wise, because I just totally suppressed all that. I didn't want to be feeling physically weak. Um, so learning to pay attention to that, and that's definitely been something that was capped and blocked. Um, yeah, that cat moon, you're not supposed to be physically weak. You're not supposed to be weak at all. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I think that about covers it. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit more to how you see all of that kind of radiating towards the midheaven, if you've got a... Yeah, one minute. Linda, am I doing okay with time here? We've, caught, we've caught up and you have now plenty of time. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wait, I do. Okay. Uh, the one thing I had failed to mention, this is huge. I mean, Saturn conjunct the ascendant. Um, of course, it depends which house system we're looking at, but Saturn and Virgo. And also that conjunct really, Lilith for what it's worth. Wait, say it again. Also conjunct Black Moon Lilith for what it's worth, like very okay. tight. Yeah, I don't know how to interpret her. So um, anyway, uh, it is in square to the midheaven. So uh, this really reinforces everything we were just saying about the importance of integration between the mind and the body 
It's almost like you're, you know, as you kind of maneuver your way through life, your personality is going to be <laughs> magnetizing any kind of blockages, you know, Saturn is like, you know, whoops, I just hit another wall. You know? Okay, so what's this wall about, right? And yeah. so then Mercury in Pisces is the ruler of this Virgo. So it's, you know, the internalization, the mental mind going inward and, and figuring out, analyzing what's going on. Um, and in dissolving the walls through, uh, in Mercury and Virgo in the sixth house, you know, through the, the, the actual physical integration of it. Um, yeah, doing, you know, the health and wellness thing. Um, it's, it's like you're fine tuning your whole physical system with all that Virgo and Pisces. Uh, yeah, the Virgo ascendant really um, emphasizes that. And then, of course, Saturn is retrograde, so you really, this lifetime, you're pressured to to release all the conditioning and, and the conditioning being around shame, guilt, I'm not good enough, the Virgo kind of phrases. Mm -hmm. uh, and then moving and, 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 and like what's wrong with me, moving towards connecting spiritually with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and also finding yourself in, in sort of groups of, if you're, yeah, or uh, what, what am I trying to say? Um, trying to magnetize and bring spiritually oriented people around you, okay? Yeah. yeah. But you're, but grounding all of this, grounding that fragmentation, South Node in Aquarius with Uranus and Scorpio in the third house, mm -hmm. um, just grounding it through the physical body is just, is just so important. It's almost like trying, um, almost also then with the, I'm almost getting like this sort of, electrical energy uh, that has to get grounded onto the physical plane uh, through daily daily work. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, needing to find spiritually oriented people with whom to surround myself, that's, uh, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yes, all right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. This sure. is very You're very welcome, Rebecca. Okay, so we have one more, and this is the Grand Cross. Let's see. And that is, uh, as you probably all know, it's uh, four planets. And again, I wish, since, uh, Linda, if I can just take a minute, and I'll take a breather, I really would like to get this box uh, to, to disappear. Um, you don't mind. Uh, because it really, it's making it so I can't. Um, I have Zoe's chart if you'd like me to put it up. And you What's could, that? I have Zoe's chart. Okay. Um, I could show uh -huh. screen that might help you, you to see all the planets on the on the wheel. Actually, let's see. Is um, so there's Zoe's chart. Yeah, it was more because it's actually this here where I'm not able to see. What are you not yeah. seeing? Uh, okay, the, I guess it probably oh, says four yeah, planets, two no, oppositions, no. uh, four squares. I think it's these right. three lines up here. That, that's right. And underneath you have the cardinal fixed and mutable crosses, and that's all right. you have. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, no problems. I think, and then I flip to the chart, and I think we're going to be okay. Okay. So we start here. Okay, so um, just as a reminder, the Grand Cross, um, there are the, the, the four planets, and there will be three types of um, uh, Grand Crosses um, based on the, um, uh, what do you call it, the modalities. So either it'll be a carnal cross, a fixed cross, or a mutable cross. And our volunteer here has uh, actually two fixed crosses, and you can kind of see, I'm going to put up the pattern in a minute, but they're, they are actually quite aligned, but a part of it is slightly off, so it actually gives two um, fixed grand crosses. <laughs> so, um, actually, I put this here. So the first grand cross is going to be um, Sun opposite Neptune, right there, and then Mars opposite Jupiter, okay? And then the next one, so this is interesting. So the next one actually brings Saturn in into opposition with Mars. So Mars is a very important planet for both the grand crosses. It's, uh, it's almost like it ties the, the two grand crosses together. So let's start with uh, the Mars in, um, 
I'm going to see, get my mind here. Yeah, just speaking with the first. Okay, so the first grand cross will be Saturn in a, sorry, Jupiter in a first quarter square to Neptune. Okay, and then we have the Mars Jupiter opposition to the Neptune Sun opposition. And so it's a, grand crosses are a powerful dynamic. And then when you have it in a fixed modality, that makes it, needless to say, it makes it quite a deal of um, stubbornness and fixity and um, desire to not uh, it kind of to, to keep stasis. And, and the benefit of a fixed grand cross is staying solid, staying secure. It's about building and it's about rooting for long-term viability. So uh, fixed bond grand cross, you know, a person could be very uh, loyal uh, in whatever project they endeavor to, to take in uh, or, uh, or with people. Uh, here we have Jupiter and Taurus in the seventh house. So strong loyalty, I can imagine. Um, and then of course the challenge of that is the inability to move. Uh, the inability to shift things. And in Zoe's case, so if you have a perfect grand cross where everything is just like within a degree or two of, of opposition or squares to one another, it, it really can get locked in. And there's tremendous amounts of tension um, to build something, to, to, yeah, and to build something long lasting and to stick with it. So, but there, this, these two grand crosses, there, there's enough of a, um, sort of difference in degrees. Like, for example, here we have the Jupiter first quarter square to Neptune. It's very tight. Okay. Uh, and then the Sun in a first quarter square to Jupiter, and that's tight enough. But the, the Jupiter in opposition to Mars is th that's a seven degrees. And I usually go by five degrees. I like to keep things pretty tight, doesn't need to be at all. But I'm thinking that it, it's going to be loose enough that there's some kind of wiggle room. There's a little bit of flexibility. And, and Zoe, when you come on, I'd really like to I'd be interested in your perspective. But starting with the Mars in opposition to uh, Jupiter, it is a, so Jupiter in Taurus is about building <laughs> security um, and finding meaning, it, it, not only that, but finding meaning and purpose in in stable relationships being in the seventh house, but um, in the earth being in physical reality of being grounded on planet earth. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't love planting and, and uh, building using your hands. Um, I could be wrong and, and please tell me if I am, I'm just curious, uh, but finding meaning uh, in that. And then Mars and Scorpio is like, well, yeah, actually um, very much, you know, the gardener that goes, that is very much attuned to the, the cycles of, of birth and flourishing and then dying and death. And then Mars and Scorpio loves the dying and the death and the juice and the, the uh, of that. And then the, um, you know, the, the decay that creates the, the fuel for the, um, the fodder or the compost for the new to be birthed. Uh, I, you know, I see that as the, the Scorpio Taurus um, opposition there, uh, using sort of gardening as a metaphor for it. Now, it could also be, you know, with the uh, Libra ascendant ruled by Venus and Virgo, uh, but Mars in the first house is a strong desire nature, in fact, a strong uh, sexual desire nature, um, and being driven by one's desires to, to get to the guts of it, to get to the truth, to, you know, to get to the juice, if you will. Um, to create the compost that, that, new, that will build the new life. Uh, and this is in, so we're talking Mars, so its relationship to Pluto is in balsamic phase um, here. And so it is releasing some desires, uh, part of the desire nature that no longer serves it. And this, in particular, the desire nature that creates trauma, that creates difficulty, that creates its own challenges, that, that doesn't really serve as the compost for the future. Um, so, and actually this is a good metaphor with the balsamic phase because it's kind of like you're in some ways attuned to what you want to create. What is the new plant? What is the new growth? What is the, the, the new thing that you want to build? 
but you're but you're being asked to through following your desires and trusting your desires to um, bring up any sort of toxic material that is preventing you from moving forward. Um, yeah, that's going to be that. Um, so okay, I got that for Jupiter, and then the Neptune opposition. So well, let's say okay, yeah, let's do Sun opposite Neptune. Uh, Neptune being an outer planet, I'm moving the Sun in. Uh, it's it's going to be in the first. It's over, so it's full phase, 180 degrees from Neptune. It's gone past the actual exact opposition to Neptune. Uh, and she does have, though, uh, interesting Mercury in opposition to Neptune. But um, I'm bringing in the sun here because it's closer to the uh, Jupiter-Mars <clears throat> uh, opposition. But of course, it brings in Mercury as well. So um, so this Mercury-Sun in opposition, this is one degree. So this is gibbous phase opposition. Mercury is gibbous phase opposition. Sun is in full phase opposition. Give a space, oh, retrograde pointing, <laughs> pointing to Neptune, and that Neptune is uh, shedding and pointing to Mercury. Oops, oops, whoops, whoops, I didn't mean to click. I'm gonna go back here. Uh, so we've got a feedback loop going between Neptune and Mercury, um, going back and forth, back and forth. So it is around, and then this is in the fourth house, looking at the spiritual uh, perspective again with Neptune, but. Uh, Hmm, Capricorn. So Neptune in Aquarius is, again, I mentioned this earlier with Aquarius, it's around gain, gaining mental objectivity. Uh, so aligning oneself with the spiritual philosophy in order to gain mental objectivity around one's emotions. And in particular, we again have a south node and then it's conjunct Uranus and Neptune in Aquarius. So there is some emotional uh, fragmentation that's being asked to come into conscious awareness uh, with the mental, I'll talk about the sun in a minute, but bringing the mind's incredible creative abilities um, and, and to personalize it. So with the sun conjunct Uranus, Neptune in the fourth house, it, it, it feels like there's a certain amount of not being embodied. The emotions, the emotional body not being embodied. It's, it's kind of like floating out there somewhere. And, and again, with the, and also a fragmentation of the emotional body. So the, the antidote here would be uh, the mercury, you know, figuring out what is fragmented, what is dissociated, what is not integrated into the body. But then, you know, integrating it through your mental creativity um, and bringing in sort of oftentimes, you know, fragmentation occurs because it's so hard to be here and, um, and sort of like floating in one's imagination or flowing, floating in the planets and other realms down here at the South Node. So Mercury and Leo is like, oh, let's have some fun. Let's create. Let's have joy. Let me write you know, personal dramatic drama, dramatic stories that brings in my imagination, uh, which is would be fueled by the emotional body. So this Mercury and Leo is very important for this opposition here, as well as then the sun, you know, your life force needing to be vitalized by your creative, by your creative expression. So, um, it's interesting, there's, there's a real uh, feedback loop going between the fourth house, 10th house, because your moon in Aquarius rules your 10th house as well. Also, the Aquarius is very much linked to your 10th house, and Leo is being very much linked to your fourth house. So using the emotions and creating from your emotions in order to gain objectivity, to gain awareness, to be able to see, um, and bringing your imagination into the mix as well. Um, and the reason why I'm saying this is because Neptune and Uranus is retrograde pointing up to the Leo dynamic. Um, so Leo is very important here for you embodying in the world, uh, not to mention um, also 
uh, your career, your work in the world, um, bringing play into your work, creativity into your work. Maybe Moon uh, in Aquarius uh, ruling the 10th house cusp, maybe, uh, maybe working with babies, working with children and, and learning how to play again yeah, uh, through connecting with children. Um, so, and okay, so that's that opposition. Mars, okay, so let's bring in the next, I hope I got everything there. So then the next um, grand cross that we have here, again with the Mars is the focal point, but instead of Mars opposite Jupiter, I'm looking at Mars opposite Saturn. And um, so Saturn being, and then, okay, let me, let's see, what is my second grand cross? So it would be Mars, 10 degrees, Uranus. So between the South Node and Uranus, and then the Saturn. And then we have the, oh, right, of course. So um, this second grain cross is um, completely determined by the, the nodal axis. So what we've got here is Mars, um, Mars opposite Saturn in, in square to the nodal axis. Interesting. So um, as many of you know, in evolutionary astrology, any planet square to the nodal axis means it skips steps. So this particular grand cross has been worked through before in previous slides. However, I'm gonna start with Mars here. It's been flipping back and forth between the south, whoops, the south node. So Mars and Scorpio is like, oh shit, this really hurts, ouch. <laughs> I'm going through the depth, um, depth part of the cycle and it's extremely painful and, and traumatizing. I am disappearing. I don't wanna be here. I'm going into my imagination or I'm going to visit other planets and other worlds. Um, or so that, that would be one way of dealing with it. Uh, and then the other way would be, um, yeah, no, let me, uh, you know, Mars and Scorpios, let me play it out. Uh, Mars and Scorpio in square to the Leo. Let me, um, I'm just going to, you know, engage, you know, Mars and Scorpio uh, with the juice of life and create uh, my, uh, Kind of my, you know, actually Mars and me, yeah, I'm kind of missing this here. I saw it before. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, Zoe, what your work in the world is. Um, but definitely, like, oh, okay, there we go. Working with, maybe with children, traumatized children. Um, working, you know, the Leo kind of energy or creativity publicly as your career, your profession, but uh, working with people who have uh, trauma, you know, and really enjoying that. And that's great. However, um, you, you, you're being asked in this lifetime to integrate um, the part of your mind that got fragmented due to trauma um, and, and to bring it in back into your body. Um, so in, in some ways, you know, fragmentation kind of develops independently of, of the rest of the personality, and it can develop a real genius-like kind of mental quality to it. So it's like kind of discover the genius part of your quality and bring it into the world, into the intensity of your life's experience uh, and create from that and, and work with kids who, let's say, who've been um, mentally fragmented or having also trouble being here on this plane. Um, so, and as, so in evolutionary astrology, again, the nodes go in reverse, they go clockwise instead of counterclockwise. So her, your north node is um, in the first, uh, what do you call it, first quarter square. Let me see 10 degrees, it's actually crescent square, but it's in a square dynamic. And um, this is the um, resolution node. So, as we know, we, we're always trying to, our evolutionary intention is always moving towards North Node and the, uh, or our North Node. But uh, Zoe, this would be moving towards North Node and Leo, uh, integrating the Mars and Scorpio. Uh, the resolution point in her case would be the North Node. Someone else, it may be the South Node um, for this Mars dynamic. So really, um, so the North Node in the 10th house, you know, really focusing on career, um, as a release point for this uh, sort of the stuckness of the Grand Cross, bringing in creativity, bringing in joy, bringing in play, maybe working with children um, as a way to stimulate the creativity. Uh, so that would be that. And then the Saturn 
its resolution node is a south node. Um, yeah, so Saturn and Taurus uh, can be very stubborn, very, very, very stubborn, and then Jupiter and Taurus too, in, in relationships with other people. Uh, what is your Venus in? Uh, Venus in Virgo. Um, yeah, based upon some kind of conditioning uh, that you were raised with. Although it's in the 11th house, I'm not sure quite what to do with that, so I'm going to let that one go. But the, where I was headed with, where I was going was the south node is the resolution point for um, a, a way to release the energy and to help you to integrate the south node axis with the north node axis with this uh, Saturn or Mars opposite Saturn. So Saturn and Taurus, um, yeah, it is pointing to in, in relationships. Um, I can imagine you also have very loyal, that you're very loyal in relationships uh, and interested in the importance of building relationship um, and security uh, through relationship. But then Mars comes along here and the sexual desire just kind of totally breaks that apart. It's like being in a, a very comfortable relationship and the Mars and Scorpio can come in and say, oh man, I'm so attracted to that other person. Person. God, I don't know what to do with all that energy. So the, um, oh, that sexual energy. Um, of, so of course it would be around building one's relationship on upon one's values um, or having them you know, more strongly aligned with one's values, but also bringing the uh, south node Uranus, very important to have partners or friends, uh, people who are like-minded people, like your, like your tribe, if you will, um, your soul tribe, uh, people that uh, you can have the kind of discussions, emotional. So you've got, you know, uh, Aquarius and the emotional body, uh, you know, that totally inspire you um, would be very important as a way to integrate this Mars Saturn. So your integration point for the Mars would be your North Node, your integration point for Saturn would be the South Node. So the more you integrate each of those, these nodes, uh, the higher the functioning will be over time. So I think I'm going to end there and let Zoe on, come on board. I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts. Hey, um, yeah, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, sort of looking into all of that and interpreting all of that. It seems like a lot. <laughs> um, I'm super duper new to astrology, so I will say that I missed a, a probably good chunk of it, but yeah, from what I, I did okay. catch, um, you were spot on, just like absolutely everybody else has said, um, with regards to the loyalty and with, with family and relationships and, you know, finding my soul tribe, as you put it, it's a... Uh, you know, that's been really hard because of my stubbornness and my inability to let relationships that don't serve me go. Um, yeah, so I think that that's really interesting that you could see all of that from my chart that, you know, most people can't pull out of me. Um, I did want to ask you about the, the feedback loops. I wasn't quite sure yeah. what that was sort of like what that means in, in layman's terms, if you can sort of explain sure. it more to me, I would appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for bringing, I can get lost in my own astrology. So thanks for bringing me back here. Uh, so the, the feedback loop it actually has to do with these retrogrades. So whenever a planet is um, in uh, retrograde motion, in order for it to evolve, it needs to shed the conditioning um, or the whatever is limiting about that particular archetype. And this particular, it, it's the archetype of Aquarius. So Neptune and Aquarius could be, you know, someone who's at, who lives in their imagination, kind of like in the scientific world that uh, is in, rather than being here now, because in, in with the South Node there, it's like, it's hard to be in the emotional body. So it's kind of like you immediately go mental, right? Uh, for whatever will inspire you. Uh, do you read like science fiction novels or um, things like that? Yeah, I I do, and I especially did when I was a little bit younger. I would just devour them constantly. Yeah, um, yeah, because like you've said, it it was sort of that 
escape almost like yeah. oh, go into this totally crazy world <laughs> and, and, and a wonderful that. world yeah totally inspiring I mean you can create anything in those worlds that you know so much bigger than the the emotional pain of being in this world yeah. so so the feedback loop is so self node uh, we're, we're always our, our evolution we're always being pushed towards our north node okay so you're being asked to come down from the mental realm, especially, you know, the realm that is kind of floating around the planets and having a blast with other civilizations on other planets and, 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 and creating, uh, you know, find your joy in your own creativity. That's the North Node in Leo. Uh, and then conjunct your sun, I mean, your, your sun in Leo, you know, the, the joy of life, the joy of creation. So what do you do for work in the world? Yeah, um, I am currently a photographer, but sort of huh. have jumped around a lot. Um, I, I was a writer for a while, I did poetry for a while, and now I'm onto photography and, you know, sort of always moving <laughs> and always trying to experience new things. I've also worked with children for years and years, which you kept bringing up, which I thought was was funny because I've always felt really called to children and really, you know, motherly. Even when I was a young child, I would, uh, I would get called the mother hen of my groups of friends. Oh, really? Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's the moon in Aquarius. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I also thought it was interesting that you brought up um, that that there was something going on that I'd worked through before in a previous life because that's been a common theme for me recently. Um, I had like a very spiritual experience um, and it really brought out a lot of emotion and um, I've always had sort of a strange spiritual connection to my own mother um, and, and she's felt it too and when I was a really young child I would say sort of like strange things to her about our past lives or things we would do yeah. or things you know we enjoyed doing together and uh, you know she has stories like that too of Wow. You know, the way that these things present themselves in your life, you know, reoccurring dreams or, or feelings mm -hmm. when something happens or different things like that. So, so yeah, it's, it's reassuring to hear that I'm not totally crazy and that there's something there that like, I'm still working. Yeah. On. Right. So, you know, you're, you're definitely evolving that part of you. So it's very important that you not, um, I won't say fragment from it, but I, what I mean is that you, you, you said that you let it go. Okay. Um, yeah. it, it, because then that's what I meant by the feedback loop is, is like, oh, I forgot where's my cursor there. So it's like your, your Mercury retrograde is pointing right back at the Aquarius. So for example, the photography, you know, it's like the, the, all this Aquarius stuff is like your visionary abilities, amazing visionary and imaginative because Neptune's in Aquarius too, abilities, right? So it's important that you not let that go. You're being asked to integrate that into your professional career into your work um, in, a, in a way that you feel like it's a creative outlet for you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for all of that. I uh, okay. feel like my head is on my shoulders a little bit better now after <laughs> hearing all these things <laughs> sort of manifesting Good. itself in, in my life. Yeah. So, and the last thing I want to say about that, it's really important to pay attention to your sexuality. Mars and Scorpio in the first house, right? You know, if, um, you know, Mars and Scorpio, follow your desires. The Mars and Scorpio desires to merge with something greater than itself, to create something greater than itself. Um, and, but also to take responsibility, Saturn in opposition to it, to not only you know, like not only kind of dig around in the, the, the compost, <laughs> the juices mm -hmm. of the compost, but to actually build something with it, to, get, to learn how to utilize it, and maybe uh, to build, and it's got something to do with relationships, you know, um, yeah, to build long-term relationships. So, it, we, you know, in your relationship, are you in a relationship? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm in kind of a funny relationship. I say that only, you know, all relationships are unique, but I've been in a relationship with my fiance for um, like an official re relationship for three years, but we were friends for like five before that, where we were like, we're only friends. And everybody was like, that's not true. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and we've collectively gone through his um, 
he, he's transgender and his transition has, has happened throughout our relationship. So I thought that that was interesting as well that you brought up the relationship and sort of the, the change within a relationship and the sexuality aspect of that and everything. The sexuality is very important. You have to integrate that into yeah. the relationship. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I know it's kind of like needless to say, but yeah. uh, coming with all that Aquarius, you know, it's funny, the, the Aquarian friends, and you started as friends, that's what all that Aquarius is. That's the South Node. So it's like, yeah, no, you're, you guys are here to play in life. Um, you know, experience the joy of life in your bodies and using your sexual sort of magnetic attraction in order to build something better and create um, greater together and stronger together. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Wow, and I think we're kind of ending on time too, which is amazing. So I'm gonna end the show here. Is there anything remaining? I mean, we actually have three more minutes. So is there anything remaining that um, anyone would like to add or have a question about? I can't think of anything. I think that was great. Thank you. Okay. That, okay. I guess, I don't know, I mean, this is probably really common, but um, any tips on, because there's so much information, you know, aspects that are flying at each other with this kind of chart, you know, the pattern interpretation. Uh, do you have any tips on how do you integrate that kind of soup? Um, Who is speaking? Is this Zoe? Uh, this is Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca. Um, I would need to pull up your chart, but I, I stopped the share. So rather than, let me just take a look at it. So, um, well, for you, Rebecca, it really is about the, um, the, the Mercury in Pisces, you know, mm -hmm. really. Where are Rebecca? I think you were the next to last, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, that's okay. So, what leads you to that as kind of the the linchpin? That is the apex point of both your yod and um, and it's the the tail of the kite. So it's a combination. So Neptune rules your Mercury and Pisces, right? So it's kind of, it's very, it's meant quite mental. It's like spiritual mental act, men, mentality, if you will. But um, so Mercury and Pisces, you know, it could be writing, um, writing, bringing in your experiences because Neptune and Sag is in the third house. So bringing your experiences into understanding through writing. And, and so whatever, you know, Saturn Virgo on the ascendant, whatever, sort of uh, challenging um, life experiences you're having. I think it's very important to process them through writing and bringing a spiritual perspective. And because your midheaven is so strong, it's important that you, I see that you, you know, you're becoming a teacher um, or if you, you know, whether you're doing kind of the extroverted teaching or you're doing the Virgo introverted writing, writing books as a way to process um your experiences of which i believe are quite unique okay uh so it's in and something that in very so with the mercury in sixth house in a way that would be a practical use to other people hey, thank yeah. you yeah um how do you do like how do you so we might be out of time but like just in general you're doing this kind of interpretation um do you have like a secret to oh my gosh how do we you know kind of find the the linchpin here uh, well, with the actually the beauty of this whole thing, the chart patterns, um, which was something I didn't know anything about when I started. So I, um, it's actually was learning about the chart patterns and which were the like apex planets or which are the planets that are the driving forces mm -hmm. um, that that can break you out of the lock, if you will, or break you out of the sort of unconscious floating repeating the same patterns over and over again. So it really was through studying these patterns um, in order to understand how to lock them, unlock them, sorry. Um, that actually, so each pattern has its kind of secret unlocking point, if you will. <laughs> yeah. All right, it's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you again. You're very welcome. Oh, Christina, Christina, I actually have. Oh, go ahead, oh. go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say that 
there there's i'm going to send you the date for this uh privately through zoom here in just a second but i think that it would be very interesting for you to look at because it caught me off guard when i was looking at this person specific chart and it's it's really unique um i haven't seen something like that so i'm going to send you that date and i just wanted to see what your thoughts are that at some point uh this is andrews and we had emailed at one point in time so sure. you, you can send me other information or we can meet up at some other time because i don't want to take up everybody else's time so i'm going to go ahead and send you that date right now okay and so the is it, do you but you got to have a time and place too right oh yeah um yeah i can send you that as that. well yeah because the um rotation of the earth is so fast I've, and you know what houses things fall into or is really important to the interpretation right yeah. right yeah no i'll send that to you in just a moment when i find my tablet again okay <laughs> it's okay um so yeah i'd like to say something to rebecca um, and yours was a kite with Neptune at the apex, right? Correct, yep. yes. Great, great. Um, the, the energies of the Grand Trine are flowing around really happily. They're kind of locked in. They're not really achieving very much. But that funnel off to Neptune, that's where you have the release. And that's where the, the, the Grand Trine energies are expressed through that Neptune. So it's in, that is the lock, that is the key for you. Um, yeah, it needs expression um, and very much to do with writing, uh, publishing perhaps. And you do have the uh, ability to become actually quite famous with mm -hmm. the midheaven opposite that point. And also Neptune at the point, at the point of the apex is seen as quite weak, but it actually is not. It's actually your greatest talent and gift. Huh. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> Christina, over to you to wind down and uh, okay. Okay, all I just want to say is thank you everyone. It was a real privilege to be able to look at your charts and try to pull all this together and, and for me to learn about the patterns and how to work with them in a person's chart. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Christina. Would everybody now please unmute and thank Christina Hardy. Thank you so much again. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Christina. Christina. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.